Hello, welcome to another lesson of Make Science Easy. We're carrying on with the biology course. I hope you're enjoying it so far. I hope you're learning a lot. And today, we're going to be learning about the topic of plant nutrition. Plants get their nutrition through the process of photosynthesis. Now, if we break down what the word photosynthesis means, photo means light, and synthesis means to make. So, photosynthesis literally means to make from light, which means plants make their own nutrients, at least in terms of their food, what they get their energy from. Photosynthesis occurs mainly in the palisade cells in the leaves. These are found at the top of the leaf. Palisade cells contain a large number of chloroplasts, and these are the organelles that absorb sunlight. So these chloroplasts allow lots of sunlight to be absorbed by the plant, and this means that lots of photosynthesis can occur. Chloroplasts also contain the green pigment called chlorophyll. It's this green colouring that allows the light to be absorbed into the plant. Let's take a look at an image of a leaf, just to see what's really going on in photosynthesis. Carbon dioxide is taken in by the leaf, and carbon dioxide enters through holes in the leaf called stomata. Water enters the leaf through the stem. And this water initially enters the plant in the root. And it will travel up the plant through the xylem vessels. And once it's in the leaf, it will then mix in the mesophyll layer. Sunlight hits the leaf. And this provides energy that is required for photosynthesis. So water carbon dioxide and sunlight are all needed for photosynthesis to take place. Glucose is a sugar that is produced in photosynthesis. So the sunlight provides energy which allows the carbon dioxide and water to combine to form glucose. Oxygen is also produced in photosynthesis. This is a waste product and it exits the leaf through the stomata, the same holes that the carbon dioxide entered the leaf through. So, water, carbon dioxide are the raw materials we start with when we have photosynthesis, and glucose and oxygen are the products produced. Sunlight is merely providing energy that allows this reaction to happen. So this is a type of reaction called a photochemical reaction. We can also substitute the words for the symbols. So water is H2O, carbon dioxide is CO2, glucose is C6H12O6, and oxygen is O2. Knowing the chemical formula for each substance in photosynthesis allows us to construct symbol equations, which are very useful because they can explain what is going on in the reaction. Our word equation for photosynthesis is as follows. Carbon dioxide plus water makes glucose plus oxygen. We also need chlorophyll, our green pigment, and we need light energy in order for photosynthesis to occur. We also need to know the symbol equation for photosynthesis. So we're going to need to use the symbols that we saw earlier. CO2 plus H2O makes C6H12O6 plus O2. I'm sure you've heard me say this in other lessons, but I'm going to point it out again. The arrow means a chemical reaction has occurred. The arrow is not an equal sign. In a chemical reaction, new chemicals are made. These chemicals are different from the chemicals that we started off with. So it is never an equal sign. We use an arrow to represent that a chemical reaction has occurred. So our reactants, carbon dioxide and water, our products, glucose and oxygen. Now, we want to balance this equation. We want to make sure that we have the same amount of each element on each side of the reaction. So we should have an equal number of carbon atoms before and after the reaction. An equal number of oxygen atoms before and after the reaction. An equal number of hydrogen atoms before and after the reaction. 
And this is because there is a law of science that tells us in a chemical reaction, we cannot create or destroy matter. We can only change it. So there should be the same number of atoms before and after the reaction. This will give us a balanced equation. So on the reactant side, we have one carbon. On the product side, we have six carbons. On the reactant side, we have three oxygens. On the product side, we have eight oxygens. And on the reactant side, we have two hydrogens. And on the product side, we have 12 hydrogens. So we can see that nothing is balanced. We need to balance this equation. Now, I can only change the number of molecules that each compound has. So I cannot change it to be C6O2 for carbon dioxide because that creates a different compound. I can change the number of carbon dioxide molecules, but I cannot change the chemistry of carbon dioxide. I can see that I have one carbon on the reactant side and six carbons on the product side. I know that one fits into six, six times. I have three oxygens on the reactant side and I have eight oxygens on the product side. I know that three does not fit into eight. So I'm going to ignore oxygen for the time being. Hydrogen as well. I know that I have two on the reactant side and 12 on the product side. Two fits into 12 six times. So I now know that carbon and hydrogen, I can make balance quite easily. So I'm gonna balance hydrogen first because it's a very easy element to balance. I place a number six in front of H2O. This means I have six molecules of water. So I have six times two hydrogen atoms. So I now have 12 hydrogen atoms. I have six times one oxygen atoms. So I have six oxygen atoms in water and I have two oxygen atoms in the carbon dioxide. So I have eight oxygen atoms. So I can now see that my hydrogen and my oxygen are balanced. This is good, this is what I want. My carbon is not balanced. So I place a number six in front of carbon dioxide. Six times one carbon is six carbon atoms. However, I'm also multiplying six by O2, which is another 12 atoms. So I have 12 oxygen atoms in the carbon dioxide and six oxygen atoms in the water. This gives me 18 oxygen atoms. So my carbon is now balanced and my hydrogen is now balanced. My oxygen is not. So I take a look at my numbers. I can see I have 18 oxygens on the reactant side and I have eight oxygens on the product side. I also notice that I have six oxygens within the glucose and two oxygens as elemental oxygen. It is always going to be easier, and in fact, it's the only way that's possible, to balance the elemental version of oxygen because then I'm not changing the number of carbon and I'm not changing the number of hydrogen. So I know that six of my oxygens on the product side must be kept in glucose. 18 minus six is 12. So I need to create 12 oxygen atoms on the product side. And the easiest way to do this is to multiply O2 by six. Six times two is 12. So I now have six oxygen atoms on the glucose and I have 12 oxygen atoms in the oxygen. Six plus 12 is 18. I have now balanced the reaction for photosynthesis. The complete symbol equation is 6CO2 plus 6H2O makes C6H12O6 plus 6O2. Leaves have got lots of adaptations that allow them to complete photosynthesis. One of the most obvious adaptations is that leaves are broad, so they can absorb a large amount of sunlight. 
The more sunlight a plant absorbs, the more energy it gets and the more photosynthesis that can occur. If we look at a cross section of our leaf, we can see the different layers. We have the cuticle at the top, followed by an upper epidermis, a palisade mesophyll layer, a spongy mesophyll layer, and a lower epidermis. We also have something called a stomata, which is a hole in the underside of the leaf that allows water out and oxygen out of the leaf and carbon dioxide into the leaf. And we have something called a vascular bundle that contains xylem, which carry water up the plant, and a phloem, which carries substances required by the plant, either up or down the plant, and the movement of substances around the plant is called translocation. Now the palisade layers contain the chloroplasts. There are chloroplasts in other parts of the leaf, but it is mainly in the palisade layer. And you'll notice that the palisade layer is close to the top of the leaf. This means that it gets lots of sunlight and has lots of chloroplasts, so it can use that sunlight for photosynthesis. The spongy mesophyll layer, which is the layer below the palisade layer, has lots of air gaps. This allows gases to mix. Carbon dioxide from the atmosphere will mix with oxygen produced by the plant, and this carbon dioxide will be used in photosynthesis. The leaf is also very thin. This means that gases do not have to diffuse very far, which makes the process much faster. I've already mentioned this, but xylem cells carry water from the plant's root up to the leaf. The phloem carries glucose and other essential substances to the rest of the plant. Our top layer, the cuticle, is very waxy and wax is waterproof. This means that water is not lost by the plant. This is obviously important because the plant or the leaf does not want to be losing water. It wants to be using it for photosynthesis. The stomata, the holes at the bottom of the leaf, open when there's water available, allowing carbon dioxide in and allowing photosynthesis to occur, and they close when there's not enough water. This prevents excess water being lost, and it means that when the conditions are correct again, they can open and more photosynthesis can occur. Also, the stomata allow carbon dioxide gas in for photosynthesis, and they allow the waste product of oxygen out. Now, glucose is one of the most important substances that plants have. It can be used directly in respiration. Glucose plus oxygen makes carbon dioxide plus water plus energy the reverse reaction to photosynthesis. So glucose is the primary food source for a plant. Glucose can also be used to provide energy to make amino acids. Amino acids can make protein. Protein is required for growth and repair in a plant. Glucose is used to make cellulose. If you join lots of glucose molecules together, they form starch. Starch can then form cellulose. Cellulose is essential in plants because it's used to make the cell walls. Glucose is also used to make sucrose, which is a, another type of sugar that can be used in the plant, and to make starch. And starch is a long-term energy store for the plant. So when the plant goes through periods where it's not photosynthesizing, maybe because it's dark, maybe because the weather conditions are no longer appropriate, it can then use those starch reserves to provide energy even when there is no photosynthesis occurring. It is possible to test a plant to see if any photosynthesis has occurred, and it's actually quite easy to do. So any plant that's recently been photosynthesizing will have converted some of the glucose into starch. When we test to see if this has happened, we first of all actually need to remove any chlorophyll from the plant. In order to do this, and I'm only going to explain this briefly because we don't really need to worry about this too much at the moment, but you need to boil the plant in alcohol, in ethanol. This will remove the chlorophyll from the plant, leaving a white leaf. We can then test the leaf using iodine solution. Iodine solution is normally a brown or red color. However, when it comes into contact with starch, it will turn to a purple or black color. The more starch is present, the darker the color will be. In summary, 
Photosynthesis occurs in plants to provide food. Leaves have numerous adaptations to allow photosynthesis to occur. Photosynthesis needs carbon dioxide, water and light energy to happen. It takes place in the chloroplasts, which are found in the spongy mesophyll layer. The reaction is carbon dioxide plus water makes glucose plus oxygen. Or 6CO2 plus 6H2O makes C6H12O6 plus 6O2. And plants use glucose for many purposes, including respiration for energy, storage and growth. And iodine solution turns black if placed on a leaf that has starch present. I hope that you've understood the vast majority of this stuff. I hope it's been enjoyable. Remember, keep on doing your quizzes, keep on using your resources, and until next lesson, keep learning.